On behalf of Boulder Community Health, it's my pleasure to introduce this evening's speaker, Brian Davis. Dr. Brian Davis is a fellowship trained in orthopedic sports medicine and shoulder and elbow surgery and completed extensive training in both. Dr. Davis is highly skilled in treating a broad range of conditions of the shoulder, elbow, and knee. He specializes in arthroscopic surgery, fracture care, joint replacement procedures, sports injuries, ligament repair and reconstruction, cartilage injury and repair, rotator cuff repair, and limb realignment procedures. During his sports medicine fellowship, he was a fellow team physician for the Denver Broncos and the Colorado Rockies. He, had all, he has also traveled internationally for slope slide coverage of US ski and snowboard team events and on medical and surgical mission trips in Haiti and Guatemala. Dr. Davis works collaborative, collaboratively with his patients to help them understand their condition and get them back to their activities and sports through both non-surgical and surgical methods. He uses the safest, latest, and most effective methods of treatment and offers a variety of surgical techniques to meet their individualized needs. Dr. Davis sees patients at Boulder Center for Orthopedics and Spine. Welcome, Dr. Davis. Thank you everyone for joining me tonight as we talk about ACL injury prevention and management. And we can dive right into our slides. So I, uh, as a millennial, I had to ask ChatGPT what I should talk about. And thankfully I did this after I already had the PowerPoint ready. And when I asked it, this is the information that it gave to me, and this is very similar to what we'll be chatting about tonight, but you can see that all of this information um, is a huge topic to cover, but we'll try to get through all of this for you tonight. Here's the outline of what we'll be chatting about. First, I'd like to introduce myself to you since I'm the new guy in the Boulder sports arena. We'll talk about the ACL anatomy and function, injury mechanisms and how you can injure the ACL, prevention of ACL injuries, the diagnosis and how it's made, ACL graft options if you elect for an ACL reconstruction, the ACL reconstruction surgery itself, the rehab required thereafter postoperatively, and then hot topics that we talk about as surgeons in ACL injury and reconstruction. We'll have time for questions and answers at the end. So who am I? Well, I'm a Colorado native. I was born and raised in Golden, Colorado. I um, grew up on a horse ranch, and so uh, if you ever go to the stock show, which just happened these past couple weeks in January, I was one of the riders that performed there. I went to Colorado State University for undergraduate studies in biological science. I then went to the University of Colorado Medical School in Aurora. Um, I then went to residency for orthopedic surgery at Baylor College of Medicine in Houston and then completed two fellowships. The first fellowship was at Stebbin Hawkins Clinic Denver for sports medicine, where I was very fortunate to cover the professional uh, sports teams. I then completed a second uh, fellowship in shoulder and elbow surgery at Western Orthopedics as their first fellow and worked with two of the physicians in Colorado that do most of the revision surgery of the shoulder and elbow. I've also done international fellowships abroad. So I went to Switzerland and worked with Dr. Hurdle, who is a shoulder and elbow specialist and also with Dr. Pascal Boileau, who is in France and is one of the world-renowned shoulder surgeons. I now work at Boulder Center for Orthopedics and in my first year of uh, practice outside of fellowship. And I'm very fortunate to have a wife and two lovely kids. One of them just three months ago was born here in Colorado and then my daughter, Amelia, uh, who is now two years old. All right, let's get into the ACL. The ACL stands for anterior cruciate ligament, anterior meaning front of the knee, cruciate meaning crossing, and ligament being a structure that crosses between two bones. If you see on here, the anterior cruciate ligament lives right here in the middle of the knee uh, and in the front. It's inside what we call the intercondylar notch, so the very deep portion of the knee. It starts on the outside of your femur or your thigh bone and traverses across the front of the knee to end on the tibia or your shin bone. It's actually composed of two different bundles, not a single structure. We call those the anteromedial and posterolateral bundles. 
What that affords is more stability. Uh, you can imagine if you're trying to control something with just one string of rope, it becomes very hard. But if you add a second string, you're able to have more stability to that structure. The function of the ACL is to restrict shifting of the femur on the tibia in a front to back motion, but also in rotation. So you can see on that diagram that it's trying to prevent the tibia from going too far forward. The mechanism of injuring the ACL is oftentimes not a contact injury, meaning the athlete was running or decelerating or accelerating and there was no other player that in, uh, contacted them. The position of the knee at the time of the injury is usually an extension, meaning you're close to straight. You have valgus collapse, which means the knee goes inward, and then your uh, tibia and your foot are externally rotated towards the outside and your foot is usually planted. This creates a lot of stress on the ACL ligament and puts it at risk of being injured. You can see in this video here, this baseball player, as he's decelerating, it's that left knee with the brace on it right there. That's where his ACL goes out and he falls. So it's near extension, his foot is planted, and then it rotates outward. Um, the classic history for an ACL injury is usually a twisting episode like we just witnessed on a bent knee. It can also be from contact, including football tackles, and very commonly in Colorado, skiing injuries. Most commonly, if you have a ski binding that doesn't release, the ski can put a huge amount of force of rotation on the knee, and that can cause your ACL to give out. Oftentimes, patients tell me that they feel a pop or a snap in that knee. Their knee gives out and it feels unstable, and when they try to get up, they feel like they can't trust that knee. Oftentimes is accompanied with severe pain because of that injury, uh, and you'd usually get immediate swelling. The reason for that swelling is there is a blood vessel that goes across the ACL. When you rupture that ACL, then that blood vessel also gets ruptured, and it fills the knee with a lot of blood. This is an example of uh, Javante Williams. Sometimes these injuries are not very big. This is how he tore his ACL. Didn't look like much of a play, but he um, had to undergo ACL reconstruction surgery and missed a year of football. What are risk factors for having an ACL injury? Well, there are a few that we can't change. One of those is if you are female, you're at a much higher risk, four to six times higher risk than a male to have an ACL injury. We think this is because they have a smaller notch for the ACL to live in, which restricts how much motion you can have before it ruptures. They have a smaller ligament to start with, and they usually have more of a knock need alignment to their knee, which puts them in a position where it's more likely to rupture. They also have a different neuromuscular uh, anatomy. They're quad dominant, which means when they land from a jump, they're more likely to go into a knock need position, again, putting them at risk. Um, they also have hormonal differences. So estrogen is thought to stretch out ligaments. And so with the higher amount of estrogen, they are more likely to have a stretchy ACL. And finally, there is some genetic link to collagen where um, women who have a certain type of collagen genetics may be at a higher risk as well. If your tibial plateau anatomy, the shape of your shin bone is sloped, that puts you at a higher risk. If you have a family member who also had an ACL rupture, that's a genetic history and you are at two times higher risk. If you're generally lax, if you're double jointed, you may be at higher risk for an ACL injury. And if you're young and very active, you're in the highest risk category. Things that you can change and hopefully lessen your risk are how you land uh, when you come down from a jump to avoid that valgus position. You can change the footwear. If you're using very long cleats, you're more likely to have a foot that's planted and doesn't turn, and that can put you at risk uh, you can change the playing surface that you're on, and we'll talk a little bit about turf. And then if you're involved in a high-risk sport such as soccer, volleyball, handball, and basketball, uh, then you're more likely, because you're jumping, to uh, come down in that position that puts it at risk. How do we prevent these injuries? Well, let's first of all look at how common it is. So it affects over 250,000 athletes per year, and they adjust the U.S., and this rate continues to go up. Over 350,000 ACL reconstructions are performed in the U.S. annually, including revision. And yet after surgery, a majority of those patients will still have some knee arthritis, and that can be up to 20 years later. One in four athletes will have another ACL injury, whether on the opposite leg or the same leg. 
and less than half will return to sport at the same level. So this is a very serious thing, and if we can prevent that, I think it's reasonable. The other thing to look at is cost. It's about $13,000 cost for the surgery, and this is also increasing. There are a few ACL injury prevention programs out there. Two of them um, we'll talk about. Their common themes are improving strength, balance, plyometrics, and having a coach to walk you through that process. One of these is called the FIFA 11 Plus. The other one is called the PEP, or the Prevent Injury and Enhance Performance. Both go through uh, multiple different modalities that take about 20 minutes and should be performed multiple times per week to help strengthen the structures around the knee. If this is done well, in females, you can expect about half of them will have an ACL injury uh, reduction, and uh, even better in males, up to 85% of risk reduction. So it does work, but you have to stick with it. What does this look like? Well, we should start you at an early age because that leads to fewer ACL injuries over your lifetime. You need to correct faulty biomechanics, so that landing position of your knee buckling inwards is a very high indicator of risk. So if we can prevent that with um, coaching and strengthening the knee, then we can prevent an ACL injury. But you have to be compliant with it. So if you have two-thirds of your team that are doing this regularly, then you can get up to that 82% reduced ACL injury rate. You need to be doing this frequently, so 20 to 30 minutes several times a week. And so it's very important to incorporate this into your workout, into your preseason, throughout the season, um, and even when you're off in the summer. There needs to be someone watching you. So there needs to be someone that's saying, yes, you're doing this correctly, or no, let's look at the mirror, let's change how you're doing this so that um, you're doing this and strengthening those muscles appropriately. And again, it takes not just um, one type of exercise, but a variety of them to be able to get those uh, knees as strong as they can be. There's also been recently some chatter about um, using turf in the, eighth, uh, in the NFL. This is from one of the podcasts that's very popular right now. Back in the day, it ruined... We'll try that again. So this is Jason Kelsey talking we about... We went through this with AstroTurf back in the day. It ruined guys' careers. Now we're seeing the same thing with this turf. So they have the one of the most popular podcasts, and if they're saying it, then it's not going to be too far before other people start to worry about this. Well, they've actually looked at this in the NFL, and when they looked at it in 2002, they didn't find any difference between ACL injury rates when they used grass, surfaces, or AstroTurf. In 2012, they looked at it again and did find that field turf had a higher incidence of ACL injuries, but in 2016, on the most recent field turf generation, there was no difference. The bottom line across multiple sports, multiple levels of um, athletes is, well, the first generation, the second generation turf may be associated with higher injury rates. However, the third generation turf has similar rates. So we have to be careful in what we see in the media, what we um, hear from other athletes, because it may not be the whole story. All right, how do we diagnose an ACL injury? When you come into clinic, a lot of times we start with a physical exam. There are a few different tests that we perform, one called the anterior drawer. We're trying to shift the tibia forward on the femur, and if it does too much motion, then we are suspicious for an ACL injury. The Lachman test seen on the top right there, again, is trying to shift that tibia forward. And then a pivot shift on the bottom right is essentially the knee is dislocated, and we can relocate that and feel that shift as the tibia comes back into position. We usually get x-rays, and the best option to diagnose this is probably an MRI. I have a lot of patients ask me, are x-rays really necessary today, doc? And I would say yes. One, we can rule out fractures. There are three different types of fractures here that we can see that are very highly associated with an ACL injury and can make the diagnosis early for us. The first one on the left is called a Sagan fracture. The one in the middle is an arcuate fracture. And then on the right, we can see a big bone bruise there um, and a notch that occurs when the knee dislocates. However, we're still probably going to get the MRI because it's very sensitive for this injury. On the left, we see bone bruises. So that's the uh, arrows pointing out those areas of white. That's inflammation within the bone, very classic for an ACL injury. As your knee comes back and slams into the tibia, it then comes forward and you get those bone bruise patterns. In the middle there, that's what an, a ruptured ACL looks like, and you can compare that to the normal strands that we see here of an intact ACL, and it looks very different. Well, do you need surgery if you have an ACL rupture? Not always. 
You can live without an ACL, but you should probably be doing straight inline and low impact activities. If you feel like you can't give that up, then you might think about surgery. The indications to do surgery are those with a higher activity level, younger age, especially if you're involved in any sports that involve cutting, pivoting, or impact. If you feel like the knee is unstable and um, that bothers you, that's another indication to do surgery. If you have other injuries such as cartilage or meniscal damage that needs to be addressed, then we can address that at the same time as the ACL. And it also helps prevent cartilage or meniscus injury if you don't have it. If you have an ACL rupture and your knee is shifting, that puts your meniscus and cartilage tissues at risk. And we can help prevent further injury by stabilizing the knee. Non-surgical management for an ACL includes what we call RICE therapies. So rest, ice, anti-inflammatory medications, compression to decrease swelling, elevation, and hopefully orthopedic evaluation. Um, typically, if we're headed down a non-surgical route, we'll immobilize you maybe on crutches for a short period of time to calm the knee down, put you into physical therapy to regain motion and strengthen the knee, and if you need it, functional bracing and modifying your activities to those straight inline activities. The risks of doing that are, well, you might have recurrent instability or feelings of shifting in the knee, and you may damage the cartilage or meniscus because of that shifting. All right, if we've decided to do surgery, there are several different options for what graft we use to reconstruct and replace your ACL. And it starts with a decision between, do you wanna use your own tissue or do you wanna use tissue from a donor? If we use your own tissue, it has more predictable healing rates because your body is used to seeing that tissue. There's no risk of disease transmission from a donor and there's a lower risk of failure in the long term. However, we have to harvest that from you, so your surgical procedure is longer, your incisions are a little bit bigger, and you're gonna have a little bit more pain and a slower recovery. If we use tissue from a donor or allograft, we don't have to harvest anything from you, so you have smaller incisions, a slightly shorter surgery, and usually your, your recovery early on is less painful and a little bit quicker. However, there's a higher risk of failure or graft re-rupture, and there is a tiny risk of disease transmission, although we test those grafts extensively. What kind of grafts can we use? Hamstring autograft is one of those. We take two tendons from the inside of the leg um, and we double those over to create a thicker tendon. This, the benefits of this one is it's a small incision. It's not as painful. You have an earlier recovery as compared to the other two we'll talk about. However, you may get hamstring weakness. So for our track athletes who are trying to get um, sprinting strength, this may limit you. You do oftentimes require augmentation with a donor graft because we have to get to a certain size and width to limit the risk of re-rupture. And if you're a young female athlete, you have a higher failure rate using this graft because those tissues are a little bit stretchy. There is a nerve that lives nearby called the saphenous nerve that may create numbness over that area um, in the long term. The other option is bone patellar tendon bone. This is what we would consider maybe the gold standard. If you're thinking about what are the NFL players getting, this is most commonly the graft they would choose. It's nice because you get bone to bone healing on both ends, has the longest history of use and the lowest failure rates. However, up to 15% of the time, you may get pain in the front of the knee because we have to harvest that bone. There's an increased risk of arthritis under the kneecap. It is a bigger incision, longer surgery. Your quadriceps is going to shut down and take a while to recover. Um, and you do have a, a small risk of a kneecap or patella fracture because we have to drill through that bone. A newer option is quadriceps tendon and one that I think is very promising. It's a very strong graft, very thick. It's a smaller incision than the patellar tendon. There's less risk for front of the knee pain and so far equivalent outcomes to the other grafts. However, it is a little bit newer, so we don't have long-term outcomes. We have um, pretty good midterm outcomes and your quadriceps, because we're harvesting tissue from it, will shut down and take a while to wake up. The allograft options are listed here. They are multiple. These all come from donors and can come with or without bone. We know the size of this right away, and this is readily available during surgery if we need it. However, there's a much higher risk of re-tear because this is not your tissue, and you're asking a donor's tissue to heal into your body. Okay, but how do I decide what graft is best for me? Well, if you are in the age group of 14 to 22, a group called the Moon Knee Group did a study on this and gave us very specific numbers as to what the re-rupture risk would be based on different uh, types of grafts. If you're older than that, we can maybe um, take some grain of salt with that and help you decide, but you can plug in your age, your gender, your height, weight, the sport that you're involved in, and how often you're doing running, 
excuse me, running, cutting, deceleration, and pivoting activities, and it will give you that information to say, okay, if you choose a patellar tendon, you have a low risk of 2.4% that that would ever rupture in your lifetime. However, if you have a lot of knee laxity, you're double jointed, and you choose a hamstring, you're at a pretty high risk that you might need a revision reconstruction if you tore that uh, graft again. It also can tell you about your other knee. So if you've had an ACL rupture in one knee, what's my risk of having that in the other knee? It will give you that information. All right, if you decide for ACL reconstruction, what does that mean? ACL reconstruction is considered the gold standard. Um, the ACL is very difficult to repair. We'll talk about that, but it doesn't have a very good blood supply. So the gold standard has been to replace it and reconstruct it using a graft. If you come to clinic and you're very stiff, oftentimes I'll send you to what we call prehab, meaning we send you to physical therapy to get the motion back. Because if we start with a stiff knee and do surgery, you'll oftentimes end up with a very stiff knee after surgery. So we wanna get that knee moving, get the swelling down so that we can perform surgery safely. It is an outpatient or same-day surgery. You come to the surgery center usually that same day. We do the surgery and you can go home. It is arthroscopic, uh, arthroscopic assisted. There still will be bigger incisions depending on where we harvest the graft, uh, but we can look at all of your knee structures using a camera. It is usually general anesthesia. You're going all the way to sleep. They can also do a nerve block with the anesthesiologist, which numbs your leg um, even sometimes into the next day, so it gets you through the worst part of the pain. These are the steps that we would go through. So the diagnostic arthroscopy means we're putting our camera and instruments inside the knee. We're looking for the ACL injury. We're looking for associated cartilage or meniscus injury and documenting all of that with a bunch of photos. If we need to, we can manage tears of the meniscus or cartilage and um, fix those or if we need to trim torn flaps out. We then prep your graft, whether that's taking the donor graft and preparing it or do we need to harvest your tissue and prepare that. We drill our tunnels, and we'll um, show you that in the next animation. There's a tunnel that goes through the femur or the thigh bone and one that goes through the tibia, and that's where we um, route the graft through so that it can heal. We then put our prepared graft into those tunnels and secure it in several different ways. So these are actual images of what it looks like when we're in there. So you can see on the bottom left, we have our camera and our uh, other instruments that can go inside the knee from two little incisions around the tendon. We may run additional cannulas in there, which allow us to fill the whole knee up with fluid so that we can see what we're working with. This is what a torn ACL looks like. You can see there's a stump there. There's no connection of those fibers to where they belong. And then we also look at all the cartilage and the meniscus tissues to see if there's any tears that need to be addressed. Uh, we then drill our tibial tunnel. So this is on the uh, shin bone side. There's several different ways to do this. Typically we insert a guide into the knee through one of our small incisions that allows us to pinpoint exactly where we want to put that tunnel with a small pin. And then we drill over that pin to create what looks like this tunnel as you can see here on the right. We do the same for the femur. So we can again use a similar guide that goes uh, through that small incision, allows us to pinpoint exactly where we want to put that um, tunnel. And we pinpoint this based on the anatomy to put that tunnel positioned in the same place where your original ACL was. Then we can put our graft through there. This is typically, um, the graft is typically placed through those tunnels and then um, secured in a number of ways. This can be done with a button, which we call a suspensory fixation. Essentially, it's a grappling hook that comes on the outside of the bone and allows us to pull tension through those stitches and that pulls the graft up and into the tunnel. Or we can use um, an, what we call an interference screw, which sits next to the graft and compresses it into the tunnel so that it can't move. In the end, we get what looks like this ACL graft here. Um, this is a quad tendon graft and you have a very robust fixation, a very thick graft to replace your ACL in the anatomic position where it was previously. What does reconstruction rehab look like? It's a very long process, and it also depends on if we had to do something to your meniscus or your cartilage. So if you had to do a meniscus repair, that will slow down your rehab because we have to protect that meniscus from any shear forces, which usually means we're limiting your motion in a brace and limiting your weight bearing. Same thing for if we have to do any repair or stimulate the cartilage. For ACL reconstruction only without doing 
any meniscus or cartilage work, my typical protocol is partial weight bearing on crutches, meaning you can put some weight through that knee, but not full weight for about two weeks. This helps to calm down the knee from a swelling perspective and allows earlier motion. If we put you on full weight on that knee right away, oftentimes the knee stays swollen and it makes it very stiff and hard to get that motion back. You're usually in a hinge knee brace for six to eight weeks, which helps protect the knee from any buckling episodes during that time. And then you're doing a lot of range of motion exercises, usually for the first three months to get the motion all the way back. After those three months, we start some gentle and progressive strengthening. You're not doing much impact until about four to six months. So usually jogging at four months and up to running by six and then sports specific training and testing at seven to nine months, which you can see in these videos here as he's getting ready to prove that his operated knee is as good as the other knee. Your return to sport is usually after a year, um, sometimes takes longer than that depending on the procedure that you had. The early goals of rehab are again to decrease knee swelling because that allows motion earlier. We want to get the same motion that you have on the knee that wasn't operated on uh, as the one that was and we need to wake up your quadriceps. You can see in this photo, this is a patient who recently had an ACL reconstruction. You can see their incisions are still fresh. You can compare the differences of his right quad muscle, which is huge, to the left, which is just a few weeks, has really shrunk. It takes a long time to get this back, but we have a lot of modalities, including blood flow restriction, uh, electrostimulation, that we can help to get that muscle firing early. Uh, we want you to be weight bearing as tolerated as soon as possible because the bones around the knee like to see that weight. Um, it is a very structured rehab program and we want to work very closely with your physical therapists so that we can monitor that they're doing the appropriate uh, rehab that you need uh, after your surgery. Bracing is a little bit controversial. Um, we think it protects the meniscus repair and the collateral ligaments, uh, but if we look at the literature, there's really no support to say that it changes your outcome in the long term. There's inconclusive data to support if we um, put you back to sport, does it prevent you from re-injuring the ACL? Unless you're an elite uh, skier, then we know that it does seem to protect against that. So for example, Lindsey Vaughn um, had an ACL uh, functional brace and she would be in the category that hopefully would protect. However, Javante Williams, even though we use those braces in the NFL a lot, it doesn't have any evidence to show that it would prevent any re-injury. Well, what can you expect if you have ACL reconstruction? What is the outcome? Most patients are very satisfied with the surgery and a majority of them would have ACL reconstruction again if they had an injury. The return to sport overall is about 87%, but that doesn't necessarily mean that you're going back to the sport at the same level. Maybe in the same sport, but at a, a different competitiveness. The graft survival, it does, which means does your graft live in the long term? For adults, about 86% of the time, you don't have to worry about it rupturing, but in adolescents, uh, that graft rupture rate is much higher. And we think that's because uh, they are much more active in sporting activities that include cutting and pivoting. Complications, things that can go wrong, fortunately very rare. However, blood clots, issues with wound healing, infection, uh, loss of some motion in the knee, knee arthritis again quite high, and you also have nerve vessel injuries, laxity in the graft, uh, and scarring that can uh, pop up. All right, what are some hot topics in ACL reconstruction? ACL repair, which we talked about briefly, is um, not always uh, a great option. We think that for type one and type two, which means that the rupture happens off of the femur side, very close to the bone, probably have a good chance of healing. And so this is right now for select patients where we can take a suture and put it into that part and try to reattach it to the bone. And we suspend it, as you can see there, very similarly to how we would with uh, the suture for an ACL reconstruction. There's also what we call a bridge enhanced ACL repair, which puts a blood clot near that area to help stimulate healing. Um, and we call that a bare ACL repair. The re-rupture rate from this is about seven to 20%, depending on um, the athletes that we put it in. So it's not as good, uh, at least with the literature we have now, as the re-rupture risk after an ACL reconstruction, which is why I think this is still quite rare and for select patients. This is what that looks like. 
on this top left image, we have the ACL stump. You can see they're passing a suture, a stitch through that area, and then they're securing it uh, where it came off the femur side. And when you look at that, you can say, yeah, that looks like a almost normal ACL. So it would have a good chance of healing if we can put that tissue back together because it's the patient's own tissue. Unfortunately, majority of the time, the rupture happens in the middle of that tissue and it's uh, unable to be put together. What about revision ACL reconstruction? So what happens if your graft ruptures after you've had a reconstruction? Well, unfortunately, it happens between 6 to 32 percent of the time, more likely to occur in males. And the most common reason for that is uh, actually a technical error. The technical error can be a uh, issue with the graft harvest if there was damage to the tissue at that time, placing the graft in a non-anatomic position, uh, and then the tunnels being in an incorrect spot. For example, on this image uh, here on the right, you can see in the first uh, ACL reconstruction they had, those tunnels are very, what we call vertical, they're right at top of each other. Well, if you're trying to control rotation with one piece of rope, that becomes very difficult because you are essentially spinning around a central point. In order to correct that, we've changed our tunnel position so they're more at an angle, so now you have more control of the rotational stability. So that's one of the things that we would look for and correct. Sometimes the graft, even though it's your own tissue or if it's tissue from a donor, may not incorporate fully, or you can have another injury and that can tear the graft. Oftentimes, this requires more than one surgery if you've already had an ACL reconstruction. The majority of the time that occurs is if the tunnels that we drilled are too big or they're in a spot where we want to put a new graft but we don't think it would heal um, by putting in just a new graft. We have to put bone back first. Unfortunately, the outcome of a revision ACL reconstruction, not as good as a primary uh, ACL reconstruction and a much lower return to sport at the same level. Well, we have all of these subscriptions. A lot of them have come out with their Plus version, so Disney Plus, Pandora Plus, PlayStation Plus. There is also an ACL Reconstruction Plus, so if you want to add this to your list of things to subscribe to, um, you can add an additional procedure to your surgery. These are also um, for select patients, and what this means is we add a procedure such as a lateral extraarticular tenodesis or an anterolateral ligament reconstruction at the same time as the ACL reconstruction. The reason we would do this is for those young hypermobile patients who are lax or in the revision setting to decrease your risk for another uh, graft rupture. This um, really reduces the risk of a graft failing about two and a half times and gives you much better rotational stability than just doing the ACL reconstruction. And um, recent studies have shown that that revision rate goes from about 5.4% to down to 1.4%, which is a significant change. The lateral extraarticular tenodesis, you can see on the image here, we take uh, part of your IT band, which is the outside ligament of your knee, and we reroute it under your lateral collateral ligament. That gives more tension to the outside and helps protect that ACL graft from having too much rotation. However, if you're considering this, there is increased surgical time, it's an additional procedure, and you have a, a bigger incision and a little bit harder recovery postoperatively. Um, that's all I have for the talk right now. I think if we have time, is it okay to go back and try the video? So this is an example of one of the tunnels that we can use. They're demonstrating here how the athlete, when they come down, might uh, twist that knee and cause the ACL injury. These are the collateral ligaments. which protect from side to side motion and the ACL, which they're showing now, protects from that front to back motion. So you can see when he comes down, you get that stretch of the ACL. The knee's gonna bend inwards.
right, so the surgery, um, we usually use a few small incisions. So this incision is used to put fluid into the knee. There are two incisions that go on the front aspect of the knee, and that's where we put our camera and instruments inside. So here they're putting in um, a shaving tool. We have to clean up any of the tissue that's torn because we can't use it, so we remove that tissue. We also clean up the bone so that we have good bone to tendon healing. It also allows us to see very well where your ACL was previously and mark that spot so we can put the tunnel there. You can see this is one of the um, devices we can use to insert through a small incision. We put that inside the knee and we can now target with a drill to put um, your bone tunnel exactly where we want it. And if we need to, we can adjust that pin and then we create a wider tunnel once we have it in the perfect spot. And that's the on the femur side. On the tibia side, very similar process. And we're gonna drill over that as well. And this is how we'll pass our graft once we have it. In this case, they're demonstrating a hamstring tendon graft from the patient, an autograft. So they'll harvest those tendons. And then usually this is prepared um, on a separate sterile table to make it as robust and as thick as we can. And we have to attach either our button or stitches to it so we can control it as we pass it through the knee. So this is called a tendon stripper that takes that tendon and now we can um, make it one solid piece. We pass it through the bone tunnel and then we can put it on the correct tension within the knee and then we fix it there. In this case, they're using a suspensory button on the femur side, which allows us to pull that tendon up and an interference screw on the tibia side, which compresses that graft into the tunnel so that it can't move. And then that's your new ACL. I'm happy to field any questions. And thank you for listening. Thank you so much. That was very informational, Dr. Davis. Uh, we want to remind our audience at this time, you can enter any of your questions in the chat, and we will get to as many as we can. And these are in no particular order. Uh, this person says, if the anterior cruciate ligament was stretched too long after injury, is it possible to get it back to the original length and condition? So there are some cases of a partial ACL injury where you get stretching of those fibers, but they don't rupture. Um, there is a procedure where we can look inside the knee with the arthroscope. We can test that ACL by pulling on it and see how much motion there is in the knee. And if we feel that we can get that structure to heal and tighten up, we can do what's called an ACL uh, stimulation where we poke holes into the bone, we poke holes into the ACL and then stimulate that to have bone marrow and stem cells come out and to help heal that ACL. It may not be a normal ACL, it may always have a little bit more laxity, but if it's protective enough in that knee and you get good stability with it, then you may not have to undergo an ACL reconstruction. But that's uh, typically a game time decision based on your MRI, what we're seeing inside the knee, and what it feels like when we're testing that knee uh, in the operating room. Okay. Um, could you spend a little more time on describing preventative measures, um, just in general, but also uh, readily available materials for PEP or other programs, specific exercises, so the FIFA 11 plus and the PEP are probably the best documented prevention programs. Um, they are available online and um, there are several different um, exercises that are listed there and they're pretty easy to follow. Those are probably the best way to consistently have a group or a team get through those exercises and you can do um, several different sets of that throughout the season. Uh, bracing has, uh, does not have much literature to help support if it does or does not prevent ACL injury in an athlete for their first ACL injury. We know it may prevent it for skiers from a second ACL injury, um, but as far as prevention, we don't have much literature to guide us on that. Beyond that, really, it's physical therapy, strengthening the knee, 
And if you're concerned about it, if you feel like, oh, you know, maybe if I'm doing these high activity, high injury sports, should I go see a physical therapist? I would say yes. They can help you to diagnose what your alignment is. Are you at risk based on that alignment? What is your strength in that knee? And what can we help you improve from a functional standpoint, from a strength standpoint, to put you in a position that you're best uh, able to minimize that risk? So is that the best measure of success for non-surgical uh, activities is to go to a PT for some evaluation? I think that's a great way to start. Okay. You mentioned skiing injuries due to uh, the binding not releasing. Are there other things to do to prevent skiing-related ACL injuries? And should women use different binding settings than men? You can consider it. That's a very uh, almost personal thing to look at because every skier is going to be different. So if you're um, a very active skier, you're doing a lot of moguls, you're doing a lot of twists and turns in your skis, you may require a higher setting where you don't want that ski to release because if it does too early or releases at a point where you want it to stay on, that can put you at risk for ACL injury or other injuries. So you'd have to tease out um, maybe with a ski instructor or with someone who knows you and your skiing pattern well, what's the optimal point for my ski binding to be set at? And that's gonna be a little bit different for everybody. Um, what oftentimes can happen is if you go to a rental facility, they're not quite sure what your skiing level is. They may set it too high, and then when you need it to pop off, it doesn't, and instead it torques the knee, it can, it can lead to further injury. So that's something that needs to be discussed with whoever is fitting your skis, if that's you or ski instructor, um, so that you have the best setting for you personally. Okay. Um, for skiing, especially for older people, would wearing a knee brace help prevent an initial ACL injury? Again, I, we don't have much literature to guide us. I think um, it, if you're worried about it, it makes sense to do that. It may protect you from a meniscus injury. It may protect you from a lateral collateral ligament injury from the, in, um, la, uh, sorry, the ligaments on the side of the knee. But we don't have much to say that it would protect you from an ACL injury. With that said, I don't want the brace to be the only thing that you do. I'd rather have you go to physical therapy, strengthen that knee, and use the brace. That way you have everything optimized to help protect that knee uh, from an injury. Okay. Is there an age that is too old for an ACL procedure? Not necessarily. I, we talk about um, physiologic age instead of chronologic age, meaning if you are a very active 70-year-old and your ACL tears and you still want to continue high-impact activities like skiing and your cartilage uh, inside the knee is healthy, then it's very reasonable to consider doing an ACL reconstruction. We might talk about doing an allograft or a donor tissue graft instead of taking your tissue because it'll make your... Um, recovery that much easier and the risk of ACL rupture after an allograft over the age of 40 goes down quite a bit. So there is no age limit, but it's really based on do you have arthritis in that knee and what are your long-term goals as far as getting back to cutting and pivoting or high impact sports. For an older person that may need a knee replacement and has rough cartilage, do you use your current ACL or is there some material used to replace yours? If you're doing a knee replacement, so say your cartilage is gone, you have arthritis, um, and they're doing a, a knee replacement, the ACL uh, very routinely gets cut out during that procedure. And the um, components we put in for a total knee can take over the rotational and um, translational stability of the ACL. So oftentimes we'll take out the ACL, sometimes we take out the PCL, the posterior cruciate ligament as well, as those structures are no longer necessary in the setting of a total knee replacement. Okay. How many hours does the surgery typically take? Uh, that's variable. Um, I'd say on average, it's probably an hour to two hours. Some of that depends on 
the graft that we're harvesting. Depends if we have to do cartilage or meniscus work. If you have an allograft or a donor graft, that's going to take less time because we could prepare that ahead of time. We don't have to harvest it from the patient. If you have a graft from the patient and we have to do meniscus work or cartilage work, then that tissue takes longer. If you're doing an ACL reconstruction plus, you're probably looking at two and a half to three hours. Um, so it's anywhere between that one to two hour range, uh, depending on what we have to do. Are outcomes worse if you have osteoporosis? That is a great question. Um, I don't know specifically from a literature standpoint if that's been looked at. Um, I could try and find out that information. I would say if you have osteoporosis and you're thinking about an ACL reconstruction, uh, we'd have to have a, a talk about what are your goals with return to sport activities and your risk of uh, another injury might be higher, not just from an ACL standpoint, but from a fracture standpoint. So if you're trying to return to high impact cutting and pivoting activities and you have uh, poor quality bone, you may be at risk for a, a bigger injury. It's not that we can't do that surgery, but we'd wanna build up your bone with medication, with um, strengthening maybe before we consider doing an ACL reconstruction so that you have the best bone quality at the time of surgery. Uh, we have time to do that. An ACL is still, uh, reconstruction is still an elective surgery, meaning you don't have to have that surgery done right away. We have time to optimize other factors to make it the safest surgery that we can for you. Okay. Um, so it's correct to say that you can do this surgery if you have a osteoporosis diagnosis. You can, but I would say let's optimize that first, build up more bone before we go and have to drill through it. Okay. Is an intact ACL necessary for a knee replacement? And what happens to the ACL during a complete knee replacement? You addressed that a little bit. I don't know if there's more you'd like to add to that. Um, you don't need an ACL for a knee replacement. You don't need a PCL for a knee replacement either. Um, we have components. Uh, there's one called a posterior stabilized knee that actually has um, a metal component that helps stabilize the knee on the inside. So you don't have to worry about that. If you have other ligaments that are out, uh, we also have a hinge to total knee where it's connected to uh, itself and you don't have to have any ligaments inside the knee. The prosthesis itself stabilizes it. After ACL reconstruction, would snowboarding be better um, than skiing? That's a great question. So um, snowboarding is probably more protective than skiing because your knee is now not on a swivel point. It's locked into a board and you have less rotation through the knee. But you're now at higher risk for wrist injuries and upper extremity injuries because you have locked your legs together and if you fall, you're more likely to come out in front of you or behind you. So you have to take into account the risks of an ACL versus risks of another injury. Um, but. I would say, yes, it's probably a little bit more protective if you're snowboarding than skiing. Okay. Is there a preference for tissue autograph selection for long distance, the ultra long distance runners? Um, or is that individual based on the health of the tissues? That's a great question. It's gonna be based on your physiologic age, what type of running you're trying to get back to. If it's mostly straight in line, and you're um, over the age of 40, I would say we start to consider tissue from a donor. If you're still trying to do higher impact cutting pivoting, um, or you're worried about the longevity of the tissue and stretching out over time, then I'd say it's probably better to consider patellar tendon or a quad autograph taking it from your tissue because that's going to give you the most robust healing um, and the, the longest term data that we have out to 20 years plus is from the patellar tendon and it seems to do quite well. Okay. Um, so the non-surgical treatment uh, was the exercises that you mentioned. Is that correct? Do you yes. have any uh, that you'd like to go into? <laughs> um, I don't. Um, that realm is probably best addressed by a physical therapist. I would say the easiest one, and I don't know if you are you able to pan over to this way to see the knees. So the easiest one that you can um, help diagnose yourself 
would be to do a single leg squat. So if you are trying to come down and you notice that your knee's starting to buckle in, that's a sign that you probably need to look at the strength of your legs. If you're coming down and that knee stays very well centered over the front of your foot, that's an indication that, yeah, that knee is probably pretty strong. But if you have any buckling towards the inside, that probably needs to be worked on. Um, there's a lot of different exercises that can help you do that. A physical therapist would be um, better equipped to evaluate what deficits you may have and how to best address those. Okay, thank you. Uh, you had mentioned that sometimes the quad loses its side size. Uh, does it ever go back to it the same or its original size? And uh, do you, as a surgeon, uh, help that along in any way? Great question. So no matter what we do, any graft, any ACL reconstruction, the quad muscle will atrophy. And um, Part of that's the injury because we put you on crutches for a period of time. Part of that is surgery. We don't use that muscle right away, but we try and wake that up as fast as we can because it really helps to stabilize the knee. Um, the ways that we can help activate that muscle include neuroelectromuscular stimulation, which implies putting electrodes onto that muscle and stimulating it to help it contract. We can do blood flow restriction, which involves putting a tourniquet on the body um, as you're working out, and that helps to put the body into an anaerobic state faster. And that helps to build muscle faster in that area. But no matter what we do, it takes several, several months for that to come back, and it only takes a day or two for it to get smaller. Yes, it can come back, and we test you as we get closer to getting to return to sport, so around seven to nine months and beyond, to say, okay, how much strength do you have in your operated leg as compared to the one that was not operated on? And we're aiming for something higher than 90% of the strength and function on the operated leg as compared to the non-operative side. Um, and that's something that we do with our physical therapists who help test you for um, things like a single leg hop, how far can you hop distance wise. Um, and that's really testing that quad function and that quad strength as you rehab. Okay. You had mentioned um, that this could increase arthritis, especially as you age. Uh, is there a way to prevent that? Um, if you can figure that out, then we'll all make a lot of money. Um, I, we don't have a great answer for that yet. There is a lot of research ongoing on how do we prevent that. Um, some of that gets difficult because uh, we're harvesting from the knee. Oftentimes we're taking bone from the knee for the graft. And if you're weakening or changing that structure, that may lead to arthritis. At the time of an ACL injury, we know that the knee essentially dislocates and slams into itself and creates that cartilage and that bone bruising. That can lead to arthritis because we've now damaged that cartilage just from the injury itself. Putting a scope inside the knee, there is um, a risk of cartilage damage as we're working around the knee or drilling within it. Um, so there are things we can do to try to minimize that risk, but I don't know that there's anything yet to show that how can we prevent that. There's some thought that with the swelling within the knee, which occurs at the time of the injury and all the blood that goes into that, that there are factors in there that start to break down cartilage. And so some uh, surgeons are proponents of taking that fluid out from a needle poke and removing that swelling and hopefully removing those factors. But that's still a very early thought and we have a lot more research to do on how can we prevent arthritis in the long term in these knees. Okay. Uh, we just have time for uh, just a few more questions here and then we'll have to wrap it up due to time constraints. Um, Let's do this one. Tyrolia offers a protector ski binding that is supposed to help prevent ACL injuries. Do you have any knowledge of that and if it really does help? I, I can't say I do for that specific brand. Um, I'd have to look more into it. From what I know right now, there's not much to support any uh, brand or binding or brace to say that we can prevent an ACL injury. Okay. And um, just so we can be clear here, um, you're suggesting a PT evaluation first, then an orthopedic doctor evaluation. In regards to prevention or uh, after injury? 
you can address both prevention and I'd say as for well. prevention, I would go to a physical therapist. I'm happy to chat with you in the clinic too and talk about um, you know, what are we seeing on your physical exam that we can help strengthen? Um, is your knee going into a position where you're at risk? Um, and what sports are you trying to stay in? And how can we optimize that for you? If you're saying, hey, I had an ACL injury while I was um, doing my sporting activity, who should I see first? I would say it's very reasonable to come see the orthopedic surgeon first so we can make that diagnosis early. We're probably gonna do an exam, x-rays, and an MRI. Once we have that diagnosis, or even before, we may send you to physical therapy to start that what we call prehabilitation process. We get that knee moving and reduce the swelling early on, and then we can make the decision um, as to whether or not you need surgery. Okay. Um, if you do have surgery, is your new ACL good forever? I hope so. Um, but there is always a re-rupture risk, and I think that's where some of the Moon Group's data helps us to decide what's the best graft for you. The risk is always um, there, even from another injury, that you could re-rupture that ACL or the ACL on the other side. Um, but a majority of grafts we know do survive uh, in the long term. All right. Thank you very much.